Okay, this is the video now for your uh, self-study uh, activity on membrane structure. All right, so uh, the video is going to be covering the um, points in the revision grid. Uh, so if I just remind you of that. Okay, so here's the grid. Uh, we're looking at points one to six uh, in this video. Um, very straightforward topic. Okay, um, I'll be using uh, in the video um, some notes. So those notes you can actually view um, under the video. Okay, you can print them out if you wish as well. Um, so hopefully we'll cover these pretty quickly. Uh, if you make notes on everything that I go through in the video, there will be additional information I'll mention that won't be in the notes. Um, I'll also assume that you've started or know uh, a little bit about phospholipids. Okay, uh, I will give some information of phospholipids, but not everything because that's done um, on the other side of the course. So uh, let's get into this uh, membrane structure then. Uh, the first thing uh, we need to look at then is something called the fluid mosaic model uh, of membrane structure. Um, this model describes how uh, the cell membrane is arranged and organised. It tells us what it's made up of and how those things are arranged within uh, the cell membrane. So uh, this model uh, was uh, proposed by two scientists. Um, you just need to know these scientists by their uh, surnames. Um, so it was devised by Singer and Nicholson. They were the two scientists that uh, come up with this model based on uh, some of their experiments. So <clears throat> the first thing I think I need to mention is uh, these uh, structures here, uh, they are phospholipids, okay? And what you need to know for this video is that a phospholipid has a polar head there. Um, it's a region of the phospholipids that can dissolve in water, all right? So they're often referred to as being hydrophilic as well. Now, these two things here are fatty acid chains, and these are hydrophobic in nature, meaning they do not uh, dissolve in water. So, <clears throat> based on this dual property of the phospholipids, what happens is that if you were able to gently pour some phospholipids into a, a beaker of water, for example, they would form this arrangement. So the blue box is the water layer and the polar heads would actually dissolve in the water and the fatty acid tails would stick up. All right, so that's, uh, that's how they would arrange themselves if they were lying flat on the surface of water. Now, <clears throat> within organisms, uh, including humans, what happens is that water is not just on one side of your body, okay? It's actually all over the body. So when you get phospholipids within organisms, they arrange themselves like this second diagram because you have a layer of water at the top, you have a layer of water at the bottom. So water completely surrounds um, cell membranes. And this leads to this bilayer appearance. Okay, so this is known as a bilayer, which means it has two layers of phospholipids. And what's happening is the polar heads will dissolve in the water and the fatty acid chains will come together and they will be protected from the water because of the polar heads um, on the outside of the bilayer. 
Okay, so that <coughs> is um, the basic structure of a cell membrane. It's made up of many phospholipids. They are arranged in this bilayer arrangement. So that means polar heads uh, sticking out and dissolving in the water and the fatty acid chains internalizing, moving inwards and interacting with each other uh, to get away from the water. So <coughs> this diagram you're seeing now is not the complete structure of the cell membrane. It doesn't fully obey the fluid mosaic model um, of the cell membrane. So to actually fit uh, the fluid mosaic model, the phospholipid bilayer has to have various proteins associated with it. So this image here shows the phospholipids uh, forming the bilayer, but we now have uh, different proteins uh, within that bilayer, and they are of different shapes, they're different sizes, and they're actually in different positions uh, within the bilayer. Okay, so uh, if we look at the protein number one, okay, this uh, orange uh, oval shape, this is a protein that actually sits on the surface of the membrane. Now, that could mean uh, the extracellular surface, so this is the surface that's outside of the cell, or they could actually uh, sit on the surface of the membrane intracellularly, so inside the cell. So any protein that sits on the surface of the membrane, whether it's facing outwards or inwards uh, to the cell, is known as an extrinsic protein. Okay, and there's the spelling for that. So number one is an in, uh, is an intrinsic uh, protein, extrinsic protein. Sorry. Um, if we look at um, number four, uh, this is a protein um, that just sits in one part of the bilayer. Okay, so it doesn't actually go to the second layer here. Now, that protein um, is classed as an intrinsic protein because it sits within the bilayer, but it's only in one of the bilayers. It doesn't go through the two of them. Okay. Now, um, proteins three uh, and two, they are also a type of intrinsic protein okay because they are within the bilayer all right so they sat in uh, in between the phospholipids but this time they span both the bilayers so these proteins are intrinsic but they are also described as transmembrane because they go right through the bilayer okay um, the other sort of naming of these proteins that we have to be aware of for two and three, number two is often referred to as a channel, uh, sorry, as a carrier protein, okay, and number three is often referred to as the channel protein. So transmembrane proteins can either be uh, channels or they can be carriers. Uh, a channel protein has this uh, this gap or channel uh, that runs through the protein. The carrier protein is uh, is more sort of solid. It doesn't have this this pore or channel running through it. <clears throat> so there's the basic arrangement of proteins. Um, even this diagram doesn't fully fit the fluid, uh, fluid mosaic model. We're almost there. It almost fits it, but not uh, quite. So we need to have a further look at uh, what else forms a part of this uh, cell membrane uh, structure. So um, this further diagram now 
has the other components that form part of the uh, fluid mosaic model. Um, I have the names here now that I mentioned earlier, Singer and Nicholson, they're the people who came up with this model based on their uh, evidence. Within the bilayer, we have uh, these molecules here. Okay, these are cholesterol. So you've got your key here on the right-hand side. Now, cholesterol is a very important part of the uh, cell membrane. The function of it, I'll talk about in a, uh, in, in a bit later, as I will for the proteins. I'll tell you what they do uh, later as well. So we have cholesterol. Now, what hopefully you can notice about cholesterol is it's very similar to a phospholipid in the sense that the red regions are polar and they can interact with the polar heads of the phospholipids. And then this region here is uh, hydrophobic and that part will interact with the fatty acid tails as you can see there. So cholesterol just like a phospholipid has this dual property it has a water loving part or polar part and it has a water hating part or hydrophobic part. So that sits in between the phospholipids all right and actually the amount of cholesterol within the cell membrane can vary uh, as well okay the other things that are here is this structure here it's a phospholipid um, with a sugar chain so this is a chain of sugar all right and when you have sugars attached to a phospholipid, it's called a glycolipid. And there it is there. The same goes for a protein that has sugar chains attached to it. They then become uh, glycoproteins. Okay. So you can get lots of proteins and, and phosphates, uh, phospholipids, sorry, having these sugar molecules attached to them. The function of those will also be mentioned um, later as well. So the diagram as you see it there, you have to be able to draw in an exam and fully label it. Okay, it obviously doesn't have to be as uh, fancy as this, but as long as you can draw uh, phospholipids looking like that. Okay, that's generally how we draw phospholipids. As long as you can draw the bilayer, as long as you can position the proteins in the correct place, as long as you can label it, okay, then uh, you should be okay if this question uh, comes up. <clears throat> so, that's the fluid mosaic model in its entirety. Um, we've got a few more things to look at. Um, obviously, I need to look at the functions of the membrane as a whole, and we need to look at the functions of the individual parts of the membrane. And I also have to explain what it means by fluid mosaic model as well. So we've got a few more things to do in this video, and then uh, we're finished. If I just show you this page, um, it's really what I've gone through already, except um, this uh, bit down here with the um, glycoprotein. You do need to know this term. Um, sometimes the sugar molecules on a, on a protein are called a glycocalyx. All right, so you may want to use that term as a labeling uh, in the exam. So, uh, I've mentioned everything else on that page. So, before I look at why the membrane is called the fluid mosaic model, I want to do a little bit of an extension section here about uh, the proteins that um, form part of the bilayer. Now, <clears throat> you may not have started proteins yet, um, but what uh, you need to know is that in these diagrams you're seeing now, the positive and negative charges, that just represents 
regions of the protein that are water loving. So both the positive and the negative charges equals water loving. Okay, or of course hydrophilic. Okay, so on both of these diagrams now, the charges mean the protein. Wherever the charges are, the protein actually can dissolve in water or can interact with water. Okay, so as you'll realise when you do the protein topic, um, what makes a protein uh, have hydrophilic regions is all to do with the side chains of the amino acids. Okay, so I won't go into those anymore, uh, but you will learn about them soon. If we go to the other protein in purple, um, there is a region there where there are no positive or negative charges. Now, what that tells us is that the region is hydrophobic. All right, so that loves water, um, sorry, that hates water. All right, so it can't dissolve in water. <clears throat> so what's happening is for an extrinsic protein, this is a protein, if you remember, that sits on the surface uh, of the bilayer. Okay, so if I just quickly draw a simple bilayer here, what you have is an extrinsic protein will sit right on top of the uh, polar heads. Now, if an intrinsic protein is sat there, it means that that protein is totally covered in water. All right. Now, for that protein to remain there, it must have hydrophilic regions all over it. So this protein can interact with the polar head of the phospholipid and it can also interact then with the water that is uh, surrounding the membrane all right so this is why extrinsic proteins are ones that are able to interact with water all over their structure and that allows them to sit um, on top of the membrane okay now, this intrinsic protein, um, if you remember, this protein here can actually span both the bilayers. So if I just put a single layer of phospholipids here, what you notice is the top part of the protein is hydrophilic because it has the charges and it can interact with the polar head. All right, so you've got both ends of the protein being hydrophilic. So that can interact with the polar heads. The middle of the protein is hydrophobic and that allows it to interact with the hydrophobic fatty acid chains. So an intrinsic protein must be partly hydrophilic and partly hydrophobic to allow it to sit within the two uh, layers of phospholipids. So try and remember that one, make some notes on this, it is important. Um, but like I said, you'll cover proteins in more detail in another topic. Uh, but I just want you to understand how these proteins can actually position themselves uh, within the bilayer. To, to repeat myself is to do with the protein having regions that are hydrophilic, regions that are hydrophobic for this one, or with the extrinsic protein, it's totally hydrophilic all the way around. Okay, so that's uh, a little extension information there. Um, please make a note of it, okay? There will be some questions based around this uh, slide. Okay, we're coming on now uh, next to why it's called the fluid mosaic model and then we'll look at the functions of the membrane and the functions of uh, 
the other components of the membrane as well. So, um, if you look at that uh, blue box at the top, um, these are the two statements now that describe or explain why uh, the membrane is called the fluid mosaic model. Okay, it's referred to as being a fluid because uh, the phospholipids uh, are constantly moving. They're not stationary, okay? So they can move um, back and forth like that. They can even do a flip-flop thing and they can actually flip-flop and go to, to either the top uh, layer or the, the bottom layer. All right, so they can flip uh, around. Uh, so they're in constant motion, uh, these phospholipids. They never stop moving. Hence, they sort of act like a, a, a fluid. Now, the mosaic part, um, mosaic means sort of a pattern. Now, it's uh, all to do with the proteins, this. So if we were to look at the cell membrane from above, what we would find is all different shapes resembling the proteins all right so this is from above now this uh, diagram here it's not looking side on like uh, the other diagrams were so we're looking from above and you get all these different shapes and patterns uh, formed by the proteins embedded in the membrane uh, so it's this pattern caused by the proteins that's known as a mosaic Okay, so it's straightforward really. There's no more that you need to know um, about that. Now, there is one thing um, I've forgotten to mention earlier. So before we look at the functions of the cell membrane, um, you do have to know how thick the cell membrane is. So again, I've drawn a, a bilayer here. So we need to know how thick this is and it's seven to nine nanometers okay so it's incredibly thin all right so that's the range uh, that you need to know this also includes any proteins that are in the bilayer as well all right so this is an important value to note seven to nine nanometers right the next thing is we're going to look, uh, as you can see, at the function of the membrane and the function of the components of the membrane. So this page here is looking at the functions of the proteins, the cholesterol and so on. Next, we'll look at the overall function of the uh, membrane. And then lastly, there's just one extra thing that we need to do. Um, and it's it's relating to a prac that we'll do shortly um, about how the membrane can be made more fluid, basically, or more permeable. But we'll come to that last. So um, the channel proteins and the carrier proteins. Now, uh, these are going to be covered in detail in the membrane transport topic. But basically, those proteins transport polar molecules in and out of the cell. So for example, uh, glucose is referred to as polar. All right, it, uh, that polar means it can dissolve in water. So to get glucose into the cell, it has to go through one of our proteins. Uh, the reason why is the fatty acid tails here they will not allow polar molecules to pass through because they are hydrophobic they they will repel any polar molecule okay the other things they let in are ions so sodium ions chloride ions all right they need proteins to be transported in and out of the cell Okay, um, the other thing, receptor molecules. Um, so certain proteins within the membrane can act as receptor molecules. Now, a receptor molecule can, uh, can look like this. This is a general shape. 
So this would be classed as a protein, uh, but it has a very specific shape. And what it allows to happen is things like hormones can bind to these receptors and then the hormone can actually uh, regulate what the cell does. For example, uh, if we look at insulin, okay, insulin uh, is a hormone. It will bind to a receptor on liver cells and what it'll allow the liver cell to do is to actually absorb glucose okay so that's quite important these receptors they allow hormones to bind and it then regulates what the cell actually does okay the other thing um, again these are proteins um, they can act as antigens now antigens are mainly glycoproteins okay and what these antigens do is they form part of cell recognition okay so cells have to communicate with each other and they do that via these antigens or glycoproteins um, an example of an antigen a good example are the a b o blood groups okay so these ABO blood groups, these are actually antigens. So you can have an A antigen, a B antigen, and then you can have no antigens uh, on the surface of a red blood cell. Okay, so that's a, a typical example of antigens. Now the next ones are glycolipids. Um, again, these function in cell to cell recognition so very similar to antigens but uh, they do slightly different jobs but as long as you know they are cell recognition okay the cholesterol all right what it does is that it can regulate the fluidity of the cell membrane all right um, as I showed you before <coughs> cholesterol can fit in between the phospholipids okay so if I just draw a simple cholesterol there so it can fit in between the phospholipids and when it does that it actually causes the phospholipids to move a little bit more all right so it can increase the fluidity or the flexibility of the membrane okay because it's sitting in between the phospholipids so it makes them uh, a little bit more flexible so cholesterol is quite important for maintaining a stable um, bilayer okay there's the um, components of the cell membrane then uh, or most of them and we'll just go on now to the overall function of the cell membrane uh, which is mostly to do with these phospholipids because I've not really mentioned much uh, about those at the moment so lastly what do um, these phospholipids uh, do within the cell membrane well they they do form um, the basic structure of a membrane okay sort of the foundations that uh, the membrane is made from um, but as I've uh, sort of mentioned earlier the hydrophobic regions um, here caused by the fatty acid tails um, these really prevent um, the or restricts the entry or exit of polar molecules and ions okay those those molecules as I've mentioned up here need to be highly regulated in terms of how they come in and out of cells so the 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 hydrophobic region of the bilayer really prevents unauthorized if you like movement of polar molecules and uh, ions um, <clears throat> so that's really what they're there for so it, it prevents any movement of those uh, ions or polar molecules um, the other thing as well I could mention here is cholesterol 
that can also reduce the amount of uh, uh, movement of polar molecules and ions because they they do add to the hydrophobic region here okay so that that that's actually another function of uh, cholesterol okay so um overall then um the function of the membrane is to regulate what enters and leaves the cell um it's to ensure that cells are able to function properly okay so the uh, receptors allow hormones to actually cause the cells to do their job correctly um, the cell membrane ensures or allows communication between cells which is very important so it's got uh, quite a variety of uh, functions for something that is so incredibly thin right that is the function so the last thing we just briefly have to look at um, is to do with how permeable uh, the cell membrane is so from GCSE what you should know is the cell membrane is semi permeable okay and what that means is really what I just said a moment ago uh, it will allow some things to cross it and not others all right so that's semi permeable okay now the overall permeability of the membrane can be changed and there's two things that you need to know that change the permeability of the cell membrane uh, one of them is temperature and the other is ethanol okay ethanol is is alcohol so if you increase the temperature of a cell membrane if you heat it up uh, what you actually do is so under high temperatures you give the phospholipids more kinetic energy now kinetic energy uh, means that the phospholipids are going to move more all right so high temperatures gives more kinetic energy to the phospholipids so they move more and they also move faster as well so how does this increase the permeability well another little sketch if this one uh, is at low temperatures all right if we increase the temperature what happens is the phospholipids will move further apart okay so you actually get bigger gaps in between the phospholipids okay the other thing high temperatures can do uh, actually if I go back to the uh, full structure of the membrane I can explain this a bit better okay so um, as I said uh, previously you can get an increased gap in between uh, the phospholipids due to their more kinetic energy and they move faster but the other thing that can happen particularly at very high temperatures is all the proteins within the bilayer will denature okay now that term if you don't understand what it is will be referred to in your protein stuff and your enzyme topics uh, basically it means that the proteins will lose their shape all right now once the proteins lose their shape they no longer can remain within the bilayer so if we take this uh, purple transmembrane protein if it denatures let's say it becomes that shape that shape there can no longer remain in the bilayer so the protein drops out it falls out of the bilayer so if you can imagine this image with no protein here what's left is a really big hole 
all right so that will actually increase the permeability uh, quite a lot because then molecules can just then diffuse uh, out through the hole so um, as long as you make some basic notes on this I will go through it more because we have to do a prac on this uh, but just make some basic notes on what I've said so far on this um, that's the temperature now the ethanol um, again if you haven't started lipids yet, uh, you may not know this, but there is a test for a lipid, <clears throat> and it involves uh, lipids dissolving in ethanol. All right, so lipids can dissolve in ethanol. So if you were to subject that cell membrane to ethanol, what would happen is all the phospholipids would separate again. They would start dissolving, so the whole of this bilayer you see here would be completely destroyed and very quickly as well. All of that bilayer will completely go. So ethanol actually increases the permeability quite dramatically and it does it really quickly as well. All right, so you can imagine that diagram you're looking at there completely gone. All the phospholipids dissolved and they've gone. So that would increase permeability a lot. Okay, um, I've gone through everything that you need to know uh, on this topic. All that's left now is for you to make notes on this, um, organise your notes in a way that makes sense to you, um, make sure you've learnt of as much of this as possible because in lesson time I want you to answer some questions and do some activities from memory initially. All right, so you won't be using your notes initially to do these activities. Okay, so try your best to get most of this committed to memory and understood. We'll go through the questions once you've done them, and then hopefully um, you'll be fine with this little section. Okay, that's the end of the video.